My guest today is Susan, who had a near-death experience that she's going to share with us. Susan, thank you for joining me. How are you doing? I'm good. Hi, everybody. Um, I just got to meet Rich, and he's awesome. And it's no coincidence that we've been brought together. And um, I've heard his NDE, and it just like makes me know he's a fellow whatever you want to call it, light worker or seeker, you know, I feel like all of us who are attracted to each other have this divine dissatisfaction. Like we know there's more. Um, and we won't rest until we can like experience it. Mm -hmm. And I actually feel like that's such an admirable and rare thing because it, it can be so much easier to just accept your trajectory and not ask questions and not cause any waves. And I was just telling him before, I live in, I live in DC, which is not conducive at all. Like I stick out like a neon sign, you know, and I've lost so many friends. It's like, it's crazy, but I know in my heart, what I've experienced. And if anyone has any questions or like Rich, because uh, my, my story is very um, hard to believe. And if you don't believe any part of my story, I do want to say like, I totally get that. I really do. Um, I understand, especially if you have never had any um, experiences like this. It kind of sounds like this lady might be crazy. <laughs> and um, I probably am actually, but um, my story is a little different than Rich's. Rich kind of came into this in his 20s. And actually, that's really common. That is the gentle way in to fourth and fifth plus dimensional living, like the natural, comfortable way is to awaken later in life like after you've transmuted some of your trauma after you've come through that and you start seeing what you're made of wondering what more you're capable of you know and then somebody might start noticing like sparkles in the side of their peripheral vision, or somebody might hear their name when they wake up and they're like, nobody's here, you know, that's like a gentle awakening. And, and I came in back ass words. Mm -hmm. I know now that's the beautiful launch to, to, to my contribution to this lifetime. But as a kid, uh, I was born clairvoyant, freaking terrified. You know, I had the regular resources we do as kids, but that's like really limited. And for me, that was two parents who were super, super Catholic, super conservative. And they had no idea what to do with me. So I had my parents and then I had my church. And my church was a very old school church. Like, I don't, I can't, like, I mean, it's like we talked at length about Satan as kids in CC, in Sunday school or whatever. So I was born this way. And I've been seeing with my eyes open day and night, pretty much anything you can imagine. And every night, you know, my memories of what um, happened, like I, I have a memory of being in the crib and laying there. And, and I didn't know this at the time, but I have a, I have a, spirit guide, whatever you want to call it, who is actually a mantis being. And um, I have a memory being in the crib laying down and 
I call him Table. That's obviously not his name. Um, Mantis beings actually, like when they speak, it sounds kind of like almost like shrieks or screams or something. Like I don't, I understand him like emotionally, even though they're kind of non sentient. Uh, but I was always on a table when I would go see him. But when I was little, he would send down these baby mantises to like fly around over me as a baby, you mm. know, almost like parents would put a mobile like above the, the crib, you know? And, and I remember just like, that made me so happy. Um, but then as I got older, I got scared. Uh, I remember being like three years old and Archangel Raphael's right there. And, um, and uh, I, I just, I asked everybody to come. I actually asked Rich's higher self to come too. I'm like, just like, please help us all like have the most helpful, comforting, inspiring conversation we could. So my, my room is like a clown car right now. But um, one thing that really stuck out to me Many archangels, and I didn't know they were archangels, but, you know, I've seen archangels like they are in Christmas cards, like with the robe and the wings and all that, but more often, I see them as very, like, exquisite, huge ovals of, like, jeweled colored light with thinner bands of different colored lights around them. And when I was little, there was one spirit who was crimson red and I could not see through this spirit. You know, normally, like eight times out of 10, like everything I see is like a neon overlay. Like I can still see every piece of furniture in my room, but every once in a while, um, I'll see an archangel or a being or a scene from my own timeline. And it will be literally, I, I cannot see through it. It is that, like, I'm like, it's that dense. and that red presence followed me. There's a character in Charlie Brown, is it Linus? Like he had that little cloud always following him. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that was, was me. And like reflecting on how my parents, my dad in particular, would get so angry and dismiss me every night. I'd be crying in, in their bedroom and then hearing so much fearful talk um, at church. Um, and I am, I've chosen like, you know, not to be religious, but I love the shit out of God. It's just, I have my own relationship with God and I have, you know, I honor everyone's beliefs everyone's so different, you know? So um, I do not want to take that away from anyone. If, if there is anyone like Catholic who's thinking I really value my church, like that's amazing. But um, I thought that spirit was the devil because that's all I knew. Like I, I saw the devil in cartoons and we talked about it in, in church every weekend. And my dad kept telling me, you are not seeing what you think you're seeing. It's your overactive imagination. Go to bed. And I, I would just literally be hysterical. Like, did you not hear me? Like, there are two beings in my room. Um, you know, they're standing by my bed. Like, you know, and I know so much more context now. I don't really have anything in the back of my timeline now that I don't understand because I I finally broke down and found someone to help me. I had to 
to be taught how to interpret all this. But by kindergarten, I hated myself. I was like, I am, I am deeply weird. And because of the devil, I was like, and somehow inherently bad. And I did not know why. And I tucked myself away. And this is really common of anyone who is born from the top down because it is so traumatic. You don't know what's happening. And, and typically these kind of people tuck it away and they revert to camouflage, like out of that survival thing. Like I do not you know, want to be excommunicated. And if, if, if anyone finds out like that I'm watching, you know, the walls ripple like they're a swimming pool, I'm done. And as I grew older, that fraudulent way of life, like pretending as if I wasn't seeing portals and beings and, and angels and different uh, races, extraterrestrials, and astral traveling, which I had no control over. I, I felt like I was a cartoon character, like a mistake or over the years, the thing I can say, just like Rich was talking about coming out of a dark night of the soul when he was like 22. I did the same thing. That whole idea of being bad and broken kind of crusted into feeling unlovable. And I spent my life like that, just hating myself and acting as if I married a man. I knew he didn't even like me. Like, like walking down the aisle, fully aware. But at that point, I was so done. I was like, no other man's going to have me. So I better get him. And of course, we divorced. And just like Rich, like, you know, I'm 22 years sober now. Um, no drinking, no drugs. Uh, have been through the ringer with pretty much everything you can think of. I had a lot of dark nights of the soul and I channel, you know, a channel and I love that. And one thing uh, I was actually going to tell Rich before was that I, I kept looking at my life being like, why are you such a disaster? Like, like what is wrong with you? you know, uh, eating disorders, just like, you know, sexual abuse, and then like not speaking about it, because I know I won't be believed because no one ever believed me. This was my thinking. And Mary Magdalene actually likes to remind me and Rich, this is like, I, she wanted me to tell you this, actually. Um, and for anyone who's watching this, who's like, Oh, my God, yes, like, you look back and you're like, they could make like five movies out of the ridiculous things that have happened to me in my life. Anyone like that. Um, Mary Magdalene always tells me like, the deeper the roots, the taller the tree is meant to be. And that's very comforting because otherwise, when I look back at the experiences I've had, it could be very easy to slide into self-pity. So after this one dark night of the soul, after the divorce, I had a huge awakening. I already thought I was like, well, I'm clairvoyant as they come. Uh, that I was wrong. And just like Rich, my house went crazy, crazy. 
Like I was in the kitchen. I heard a thunderbolt upstairs on the single mom. And I was like, thank God my kids aren't there. But I didn't want to go up there. And I was alone. I was like, shit. I'm like, I hear a thunderbolt. And then I hear like rushing water. So I go up there. I'm so scared. And I look in the bathroom and my toilet like has been split in half like a laser. A new porcelain toilet split in half, just like, bloop, and it's gushing gallons of water. And just like, what the hell? But the plumber, I've known this guy for like 40 something years, literally. And he's like, I have never seen anything like this before. And I was like, welcome to my life. And I remember being in bed around that time, looking directly, just directly through my arm. And I like, I was so terrified, you know, just terrified all over again. I was like, no, I thought this was like over. And then the divorce happened. And, and that's when I started getting really sick. I couldn't take it. I felt like the proof of my unlovability was like decades long at this point. And my body kind of went along with that belief. And my near-death experience happened, you know, technically because of chronic Lyme disease. Um, but, I, you know, my friends knew I was dying and I was on two pages of medicine. You know, I had like a port in my arm, all this stuff. They kept telling me like you're dying. And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not, like I couldn't hear that. Um, but then the night it happened, which is, was right in the middle of the lion's gate. Do you know what that is? That mm -hmm. That time in summer, it's basically when like the earth, our sun, and then like the galaxy sun and the planet Sirius, which a lot of us have experiences with, especially anyone who has had like past lives in ancient Egypt, like those are like strong Syrian roots. And so this happened during that that alignment. Um, there was one night and I was really quiet about it. Kind of like when people make up their mind to commit suicide or if they're sober and they've made up their mind to drink again, the battle's over and they're like quiet. You know, it's like they're at peace. And I knew finally I knew that night I was going to die. And that's how I felt. I was like at peace. Like I had been on a walker, like straight up a walker with like tennis balls on the end of the, on, and I've like been on a walker. I'd had to like, like army crawl on the floor and make my kids PB and J's on the floor leave them on the floor like they were dogs I had no help I couldn't walk and the pain was too much like for anyone who has been in chronic you know nerve pain it's like it turns you into an animal that's all I can say you know like I was on so many narcotics like and it did nothing um, I was like, my right hand, my left foot were paralyzed. Um, and my friends took forever to get out of my house. And then they finally left. And I was like, thank God. Because again, my kids were at their dad's. And I could finally die. You know, it was like, they'd be okay. Like, I could do, I, I was so excited. And so I started my like, weird spider crawl up the stairs and I just felt so excited I was elated 
And that is, of course, when my guides like spitballed me on the head and was like, you have one more chance. And I'm like halfway up the stairs. And I actually really was like, what? Really? I have tried everything. Like, what the hell are you going to come up with? As if I know better than like my higher self and God or whatever you want to call it. I just say God because it's easy and it's a habit, but you can't shove that presence into a freaking word. But um, they were like, you've got to get out of your body tonight and get help. And I was like, oh, shit. Um, and I was like, well, wait, I've never asked or traveled on command, you know? And they were like, just do it. And I was like, okay. So by the time I got to my bed, they had explained to me how to do it on command. And I was like, oh, okay, got it. Thanks. This sounds so weird. Oh my God. So, um, but I knew this was true, actually, because during that time when I like could see through my arm, my toilet exploded, and I started seeing um, beings like no longer opaque, but as if they were standing there. You know, it's like it's it doesn't um, start. It doesn't. Sometimes I'm like, oh shit, yeah, I didn't know you were there, but like it doesn't scare me anymore. You know, but. It's still, I, I don't ever get used to seeing beings when it's like they block, they like, you cannot see through them. It's so, it's like, it's still awe-inspiring. But during that time, I feel like they know I'm such a question asker that they needed to give me proof. And I also want to say this for your audience, because I, I think it's helpful. During uh, this huge astral travel, right when I had that huge awakening, they brought me, um, I was let out over an ocean and I heard my name. And this is kind of just like rich too. I, and I looked up and there were like two banks of clouds. And on the right were these, uh, the silhouette of a humanoid, but they were pure white, just glowing, no features, just beings of pure white light and then on the right was um, my higher self who looked was the most beautiful being I've ever seen and um and they or she said she just pointed like that um and I looked up and they were showing me this beautiful like huge hurricane red hurricane with all these black birds and lightning and they were trying to tell me that's how powerful I was and I was like you got the wrong girl like that that like no um and then the next thing they did was I popped through this girl who I went to kindergarten with who I just reconnected with a couple years uh, earlier, I popped through that the roof of her house and I saw her in this loft, this triangle loft with her daughter and I banged into this jump rope. The daughter had tied to um, a, like a railing um, at the edge of the loft, this jump rope was hanging off and all these stuffed animals were tied to it and there was a bell on the bottom and I literally like I said I had no control I just burst in banged into this rope with a bell on it and it banged and it rang and Courtney was like I could watch her I was like oh my god and Courtney like looked over and was like looking all around and I freaked out and I tried to go back home. But anyway, I called Courtney the next day. I want to say this really quickly. I said, hey, Courtney, it's Susan. 
I've never called this girl in my life. Um, and I, I pretended like it was a dream because I, I didn't want to freak her out and I didn't want to sound completely crazy. But I said, I have a really weird question for you. And then I described the loft and everything that happened. She got so afraid that I actually had to end up like calming her down. Like I spent the rest of the, the conversation just being like, it just was a funny dream. Like, oh my God, just, just playing it off. You know, it's like she was really like, but I don't understand and how would you, and I was just like, oh God, you know, but I know that was like a gift because I'm kind of that kind of person. Like, I, like, you know, I, I want to know something is legit. You know, it was like, I kind of knew it when that happened, like, this is real. It's real. And all of these different dimensions and beings and ships and angels um, and other, like I said, other races, like they're all happening all around us all the time. We just happen to be like sharing this thin bandwidth right here together. But I got out of my body. Um, they told me how I, I rolled out of my body, actually. I laid at the edge of my bed and I rolled out. I didn't know what to expect. And I was kind of thinking like, mm, maybe I can find like an off-duty angel. like somebody's you know somebody's guardian angel who's like taking a smoke break or something and just like I had this idea of like Pac-Man like you know Pac-Man old school would like eat those cherries and like get a boost you know do you remember that yeah that was my idea I was like I gotta find an angel when I get out somehow I don't know where like I don't know where to go but I gotta find one and I need, I need to explain like, look, if you can you just give me a boost here or like, I'm going to die tonight. And I really, you know, I had to raise my kid, like whatever. So when I got out of my body, I did not have to do anything. Um, I just like my higher self, like knew what to do. And so I manifested, which I'd been doing my whole life, but didn't know it was me. I was always scared it was somebody else who was going to come in through these portals when I didn't realize I was manifesting them right by my uh, right by my bed so I could go and play hmm. and actually travel. But to me, I was like, oh, my God, what monsters like coming through there, you know, and um, there was a, you know, a speeding speed eating like faster than anything I've ever seen in my life charcoal gray tunnel and I was like why is that thing charcoal gray like for real like I'm like that doesn't like look very happy like what like what is that like what why do I have to go in there like uh, isn't there supposed to be like a colorful bright light situation like what that thing looked like like, you know, this like black charcoal gray, like lightning fast subway. And I was like, okay, great. Like, where's this going to take me? And I kind of like took my astral body and like just folded myself like sideways, like, and just went, it just took me. And when you get out of, I don't know what dimension, but um, when you are in the higher dimensions, there really, there truly is no linear time. There's, there's not, everything is instantaneous. It's like everything travels at the speed of thought, but like faster. You don't even have to finish your thought boom, you're there. It's so, it's so hard to describe actually. I mean, it's like, uh, it's just very hard to describe. So I, boom, was out of this tunnel floating in the void. 
that's what people call it. Uh, I was terrified of the dark. I still was from being clairvoyant and things are a lot clearer, you know, when it's dark, like in the movie theater. So I was like, no, 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 no. This was like my worst nightmare. Like no sound, no light, infinity. I was like, are, are, like I, I was like, and I just immediately said, God, please take me somewhere safe and good. And then, like I said, there was no passage of time, but I was in, m faster than immediately uh, just immersed in God. I, I didn't know what was gonna, I thought maybe God would just like move me to like a, another, like a, a lighter dimension with like some lights on her. I didn't know what, what to expect. Instead, God literally brought me into him and I was in God like a tea bag in a mug of tea. And what that looked like uh, were blazing, blazing beams of all, you know, all the, the shades of, of like yellow, just, but blazing uh, rays of light. And I thought God was kind of like a vague, loving, creative, creative force or, yeah, but we had this exchange and uh, it's in the things that I understood from this exchange blew my mind. Um, God knew me 80 times better than my best friend, you know, but we also had this exchange that was so sweeping. It was like, a conversation between two beings who had always been. But the first thing I was asked was, do you want to stay here or do you want to go back? And I threw, like mentally, no talking, threw up a huge IMAX-sized photo of my two boys and I was like I, I have to help raise them I'm my my part you know my personality is a big part that balances um their dad's personality they need both I need you know and I for some weird ass reason I was scared God wasn't gonna believe me like well I don't know why so I started like we have this I don't know. It could have been my horror line. We we all have this energetic, like, um, like a skewer. I don't know. It's like this line of energy. If you could see it, it's thin, and it it goes into the crown chakra. It goes, you know, down along your spine, out your root chakra, and it anchors you in this lifetime to Earth. Um, and so I don't know, like, if I was, like, pulling on my horror line or, or that silver etheric cord that they talk about. I think it was that cord because it was, like, right here. So to prove I wanted to go home, I started, like, doing this. And I was thinking, oh, my God, like, how long is this going to take? Like, I don't even know where I am. Do you know what I'm saying? Am I going to be doing this for, like, years? Like, um, but there, so that stopped. Because that was that was that was actually ridiculous, um, and I guess what came out of that, like there was so much, so much I understood. One thing which I still have not been allowed to publish. No one will publish this. I don't know why. I feel like it's the most comforting thing, but I. I remember word for word being in that presence. And I thought, I could have just murdered 10 people right now. 
and no, like no one will take that. No one, no one will accept that because the, the purity necessary for that kind of literally unwavering love we do not have that level or quality of love here we have beautiful shades of love uh, you know look at your average parent and child or a happily married couple we 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 do we have love here but it's always relative it's relative conditional there is like if my one of my sons murdered somebody i would still love him but there would be like dynamics that would change like i would also feel so self-centered and be like oh my god what are people gonna think of me like as a mom with god I heard this metaphor once about a tree and it was from my, one of my first meditation teachers. And she said, just like a tree, like if Jeffrey Dahmer walked beneath like this huge, beautiful tree, the tree would not recoil its branches. Like <laughs> the tree would not pass judgment and then be like, yeah, no, you're not worthy of my shade. And then like, pull up. Just like if Mother Teresa walked under that tree, their tree wouldn't like fluff up extra large for her. The tree would just be, it's a tree. That's God. There is no vacillation, no reaction. There are no shades of anything. There is no judgment. There is no death. Fear is something we've created and we've imprisoned ourselves in. But it's not true. Even my, my kid came home yesterday with a quiz from his school and it was talking about Jesus, who's one of my guides, one of my main guides, uh, coming back for judgment day. And we had conferences yesterday. And um, yeah, I brought that up. And my former husband was like, Susan, he knew I was going to freak out. Cause I was like, are you freaking teaching my kids that there's some like God with a gavel who's like, nope, hell, eh, purgatory, you, you're all right. Like, no, um, it like truly that there is, nothing else but God. And then the other thing I understood was that, oh, uh, this sounds weird. I was scared to even pray about this for a few weeks because I felt like it was, I was like, am I a monster? Like, am I a uh, an egomania. I was really concerned about this, but when I finally had the balls to pray about it again and um, meditate and, and like, you know, talk to God again, I was like, is that right, God? Because I realized up there, I was like, I'm God. Like, we're not like, I'm not like God's daughter. It, it's not, that's not, what I experienced. What I experienced is there is like nothing like this, me, the computer, like there is one substance only. Period. It's only God. And like all of us, we are God. 
and the people like us who are seeking. And we really want to know, we really want to see, and we want to learn more. Um, maybe knowing that could give you a little bit more comfort and confidence in you're right. Like if you feel like you want to know more and learn more, it's infinite and it's there for you. And at the end, God kind of like kicked me over to Jesus. And Jesus looked like, I was like, really? I'm serious. Cause I, I had really closed off to religion. I had bad experiences um, earlier with religion, with priests and fundamentalists, real weird stuff. I was taken hostage by a Christian fundamentalist once. Um, really, I'm not kidding. It's really weird. But so all of a sudden there's like Christmas card Jesus, blue eyes, light brown hair, like well-trimmed beard, cream colored robe. And I, I was like, come on. I'm like, yeah. Like, you, you know, Jesus didn't have blue eyes and like a light brown hair. Like he lived, you know what I'm saying? I was like, this is that I was like, this is so weird, but, but like he was appearing to me. So there'd be no confusion mm -hmm. as to who he was. Cause if, if he did appear, how, however he looked, he probably had dark hair and darker skin and dark eyes. Like I wouldn't have known. I'd just be like, hi, you know, but he came up to me and he held his, his palms out. And I was like, why Jesus? You know, I, I just, you know, um, but I was like, okay. And he held his palms out and he said, um, do you want to get better? And I grabbed his hands and we started flying like super fast through every shade of green that you could ever imagine. And green is our heart chakra and is also the color of uh, um, Archangel Raphael, who's like the ultimate healer. You know, these archangels are facets of God energy, you know? Um, after that, and this this is gonna be this is gonna be um a little bit weird to hear, but Jesus asked me, is there anywhere else you want to go? And I said, Yes, yes. I said I wanted to go to this particular spaceship. One of my guides, uh, who I call Perry, is a light body. He's he's not incarnated, um, not in form. He he is a being of light, like like every being. Once you get uh, to a certain dimension, do you know what I mean? Like uh, in the lower dimensions, we're we're like encased in this skin envelope. But as you go through the higher dimensions, we lose that, and and like we really just our light bodies and more and more collective and um but for some reason i knew if i could get to this ship that perry would be able to um materialize like a body i i knew that like he could somehow present like in a form that i could finally like hug and be like Perry, and and so we we flew up to this um, really big spaceship, and on the hull there was a kind of like a coat of arms. You know how like in medieval times, like the knights would wear the like they had shields, and the shields would kind of say like House of blah blah blah, and mm -hmm. Like, so on the whole, there were like all these symbols. It was not language. It, it, they were etched symbols into the metal, but it basically was like the origin of the ship and like 
you know, just saying like, like the basics about that ship, like what it, what kind of um, work it would do and all this stuff, whatever. I was like, yes, this is the right one. This is the right one. And then boom. Um, and again, Perry did this. And as, as all of you guys will like kind of notice, like when, when you're developing, things are done typically not to scare you. And so Perry created this scene for me that was very comfortable. And I found myself in like a 1950s NASA gift shop. Um, that's the background he kind of like gave me. And literally, I, I was like, this does not surprise me. From the neck down, he literally looked like my dad. Same exact body, same clothing, down to the dorky shoes, you know. Um, but from the neck up, it was just like another other white dad face you know and I was like that's Perry somebody was talking to him and I pretended to look at like rocket keychains until they left I was like do you mind seriously like I, I got like I have never met this person before like that person left and I ran up to him and I was like Perry and we just hugged like for the longest time and um this is weird, still don't understand this, but he was like, how do you feel about working here part-time? And I was like, yeah, like, I still don't know what that was about actually, but it was so good to like be with him. Like, I just was like, oh, and then boom, I woke up and I had my cane by my bed. I immediately, immediately knew I would never need it again. I just stood up, just got right up out of bed, standing perfectly fine. Uh, my blood was tested. I was about to start getting chelated, like my blood chelated. There was so much iron in it, no iron in my blood. My, my hematologist was like, what happened? And I was like, well, if you really wanna know, I don't know, I was feeling a little sassy. I was like, I actually had a near-death experience and I think like I healed with Jesus. I don't, the guy was like, he just, I, yeah, I, I have not <laughs> seen that guy since. I think he was like, I don't, you really have a problem, lady. But blood, totally good. No more paralysis, no more pain. And the thing, the one thing I had direct promised God it kind of struck me and that's when I was like shit because the one thing I promised I was like 100% I was like God I promise I will return and live transparently which was like you said worst fear I was like what if like, I was like, somebody could absolutely listen to my experiences and put me like in a mental facility. Honestly, they sound so unreal, but I promised and I had to do this very thoughtfully because my parents, I was like, I am risking never having my father in my life again. Um, so. I went to business school. I, I really tried to be thoughtful because I was like, I have to come out to my parents first and I don't want to lose them. And I have to really be able to speak about this as if I was in their shoes. I had to come out of the spiritual closet and I did. And like, I remember the first time I made a YouTube video, I was like, if anyone from my high school 
or college sees this or my, you know, like I've lived in DC all my life. I'm just like, I, I can't like, if I could go hide in maybe like Phoenix or something, but like, I was just like, ah, I'm not going to have anybody. I'm like, this is, this is going to freak everybody out. And honestly, it has. Um, but my dad actually told me something that gave me a little bit more acceptance of the fact that it is difficult to live like this and have people understand or accept you. My dad admitted to me that as a as a kid, when I'd be hysterical every night, he's like, you really scared me. He's really scared by all this stuff. He's really scared about death. And um, over the years, I've been able to tell him messages from his dad um, that, you know, I would have no idea about things that like, I didn't even know what the word meant like about his health, like it, my grandpa was like, you need to tell your dad about this whole health thing. I was like, oh my God, my dad was like not talking to me at the time. I was like, grandpa, he's gonna kill me. I was like, I can't, I'm like, I don't even know what any of this means. It was all this medical stuff. And I don't know anything like, I was like, oh. Um, but over the years, I, I've told him enough. And, um, it still unsettles him, but I do know, I'm like, he knows that this is true. Um, so I do have my parents and I'm so grateful for that. But otherwise, yeah, I, I don't know. I just feel like I'm not gonna let God down, but that is also like the loneliness, I guess, of going on a date and, you know, I mean, it's like, the, it's just kind of a weird life. I'm like living in two worlds at the same time, all the time. And sometimes it's distracting like sometimes the the other world it's like this world's going on but sometimes whatever I'm seeing clairvoyantly is like taking over everything and I don't know what that looks like to other people but I'm like just like staring or then I'm like writing something down or like I'm getting a channeling from somebody and um I just know if you're watching this if you've had dark nights of the soul or you've had unexplainable events, like that's why Rich has brought all of us together. And you don't have to feel alone. And you can ask us, you know, please ask us. I mentor women now who are going through awakenings. And I love it when I can provide relief they'll say something and I'll be like yeah I totally get that and to have them be you know when 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 you've never had anyone say yes I understand that happened to me too it's the best feeling in the world you know that that sense of identity and maybe maybe I'm not broken you know like Jesus and I used to argue about it. I'd be like, I'm so weird. And he'd be like, you're not weird. And then he'd be like, all right, numerically speaking, yes, you're in the minority. And I'm like, I'm still <laughs> weird. And he's like, Susan, you're not weird. You're just early. So that's where we left it. I was like, okay, hmm. fine. I'm early, but that translates to weird. <laughs> I'm like, it still translates to weird. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. I just, I offer all of that. 
And again, I know that's hard to digest for some people. I really do. Uh, but for, for anyone else who has ever had something like that, I hope uh, they feel very, very um, welcomed and comforted at least a little bit, you know? Well, thank you for sharing that. That was very interesting. I do have a couple of questions, though. Um, I know that you said that you were born clairvoyant. Mm -hmm. Since the experience, have your abilities like improved, or have you have you gained any new abilities? Oh yeah, that? yeah. So after the dark night of my divorce. I, my clairvoyance, like, went from, like, a hundred to, like, a thousand. That's when I was, like, seeing through my arm. That's when I started seeing these beings uh, not see-through, but, like, they were there, flesh and blood, <laughs> like, um, and then from that point on, from 2014, like, yeah, basically, I started finding teachers and channeling Claire audience, um, Claire sentience, Claire cognizance. It's it's all like it all kind of like just that was natural everything else that that came in came in naturally and like in a in uh, like not in an overwhelming manner you know and so now i'm like you know totally comfortable with all of the uh extra sensor extra sensory experiences but um yeah it that all happened after that one really big jump um, with my clairvoyance. And there was a time when my guides took away my clairvoyance and I woke up and I was like, what the hell is going on? Uh, and they know how lazy I am. And they were like, so long story short, I was so desperate because I was like, this is my whole life. What happened? Where did it go? Like, I was so desperate to find answers. It basically led me to understanding I had to open my heart up and let myself feel emotions. Because I kept wondering, why can't I channel? I can see everybody. But like, why aren't we just like chattering all the time? And the reason was like in order to channel and, and really in order to understand anything extrasensory, it has to be interpreted through the heart, not the mind. And I had decided a long time ago as an empath, I was like, my emotions are too big. I can't deal with them. And I really leaned into like my logic and tried to like yellow tape away my emotions. I just didn't want them. And in this experience, I learned like, that's why I was hitting that wall. And once I allowed my heart to open and everything to pass, there's always someone here. I'm always channeling someone there. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it was just like, like that. So that's something to be aware of too, because a lot of times empaths are very overwhelmed and they don't even know why. They don't even know they're empaths. And so like to start there is really important to get an understanding of what is happening and how to like energetically take care of yourself. And then most likely things will evolve from there. Okay. I had another question too. You mentioned that your guides 
had to explain to you how to astral travel on command. Is there any yeah. way to, to maybe walk us through what they explained to you? Yes, it was really easy, actually. Um, they just said, lie along the like edge of the bed on my side. So that like, literally, I was like, am I going to fall on my face? But I, I got up there and they just like, I was laying like that on the very edge of my bed. And then they just said, okay, now roll out of your body. I was like, okay. And I did. And like I said, I've been asshole traveling my entire life, but uh, that has been the only time I've ever been able to be like, I'm going to astral travel now. Like I've been laying down in my bed with my son while he tries to fall asleep and like I'll fall out of my body. Literally I'll be like, and like, I'll like kind of like go through the floor and like realize like what's going on. And I'll be like, go back in. I mean, I still have not been able to, have that kind of command hmm. over my astral traveling and I figure if I'm meant to it will just happen but in that case I needed actual instruction and it was life or death and so they gave me what I needed hmm. would you consider yourself to be um I don't know what word you would want to give it, but like a star seed or a volunteer, would you consider yourself to fit in that category? I think we, we're all star seeds. Uh, I think it depends when, when we choose to incarnate, we decide certain themes that we want to play out and experience and learn from and we also pick which past lives we like we set ourselves up and we're like okay like these other lives of mine will be the most resonant and helpful for this incarnation. And so if I am to successfully wake up, this bunch of other lives are going to be the, the first to be remembered because they're the most similar to what I want to do in this lifetime. Um, and in terms of volunteers, that that is i think a different thing i do believe there are people light workers whatever you want to call it like you um where we have chosen to come here expressly to serve and that's a very risky gamble because like we were talking about earlier, we, ha we have to succumb to the veil of forgetting just like everybody else. And so a lot of the people who have volunteered to be here to serve uh, don't make it. They do not make it to that place of divine remembrance and they are not able to contribute what they had intended to. But yeah, definitely. There are people here who, who like don't have to be here, but they are here to help. And that could look like a bazillion different things. I'm not talking about like it, like you could be a light worker and like a mechanic mm -hmm. 
Do you know what I'm saying? Like oh, yeah. our purposes are emotionally based. And I think oftentimes people confuse their purpose with their employment or their job or something when actually the main tool, the main learning tool of earth is navigating the spectrum of emotions and that path towards emotional mastery. So our purposes are always rooted in emotions, not function. So that's why I say you could be a light worker and be a movie star or a janitor or, you know, has nothing to do with, with your income. Mm -hmm. That's the, I've always tried to explain that to people. And, and it seems like just because of the system we were brought up in, nobody seems to because a question I get asked all the time is what's my life's purpose, you know, yeah, totally. and, and, and they're oh, always, yeah. yeah, they're always alluding to a job. Yes. You know, yeah. and one, they're always like, as if like blink and oh shit, I missed it. Yeah. Like we have, we have so all of us, we, we have so many potential purposes. Mm -hmm. We do not have we didn't come here with like one needle and a haystack, like, shit, I hope I find it. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. we all share the emotional mastery um, purpose. That's the one everyone who comes to earth is agreeing to. But beyond that, and like, we have a chakra, like, right here. Um called well i don't know I, I call it the soul star chakra but this chakra uh is kind of like a satellite it's out of the fray of the physical and it's constantly transmitting to our higher source and god and like the purpose of this chakra is to magnetize circumstances and people to whichever purposes we've committed ourselves to. And if you're listening, I promise you, you have not missed your purpose. You have not messed up. Wayne Dyer, he's passed, but he's, he's a primary guide of mine. He always says it is impossible to be outside of divine timing. So like there's never, never a reason to worry about whether or not you're fulfilling your purpose because I am sure you are to some extent because we have many of them. Um, I have a video. I have two different ways of identifying soul purposes. Uh, that are really straightforward and helpful and emotionally based. So if you're curious, feel free to check them out. Yeah, one of the next questions I was going to ask is if, uh, I'm sure after I upload this, there might be a couple of people that would want to reach out to you. Would you be open to that? Oh, yeah. What do you mean? Reach like, out to Like maybe with questions or guidance or anything like that? Oh, yeah. For sure. What's and the best way to get a hold of you? Um, info at susandyer.com is the okay. easiest. Um, and yeah, I love this. Like, you guys are my people. Like, all over the world. Unfortunately, not in D.C., but like, uh, it would be an honor to talk to anybody. And um, that is the question like when I mentor women they're always surprised like a lot of times they're like I just want to open my third eye and I'm like it doesn't work like that like we are divine instruments and before we work on any of those extrasensory abilities we have to clean out emotionally 
you know, so that we are like a clean pipeline for the divine. And then we can start talking about extrasensory, but uh, people get confused about that. You know, just, just aiming to like go and open your third eye. It's like, that's not wise. Like, let's do it the right way. You know what I mean? Um, and I'm just like you. The other main, main concern of the people I work with is I just don't know my purpose. And it's, it's so much simpler and expansive than most people realize. Awesome. Well, before I wrap this up, would you happen to have one last positive message for the viewers? I would say braving the world as your authentic self, disregarding the opinions of others and trusting your intuition. That's how we anchor the most God energy. That's how we radiate and spread the most God energy. When I was living for all those decades, I wanted to die. I only stopped wanting to die after my near death experience at 40 because I was pretty much made to become or allow myself to be authentic. And for anyone who feels like they know they're in a relationship that's not serving them or a job that's not serving them or even a part of their personality, they know they'd like to adjust, go with that because the more true to yourself you can be, that is the better aligned to your higher self and God that you will be. I'm saying that, but also that journey, like allowing yourself to actually live authentically it can feel scary uh, and it can shift. It can shift the nature of some relationships around you. You know, if there are certain people who've always known you one way, if they're not able to bend with you, as you release anything that's not true for you, you may find yourself like, you may find yourself having conversation that's uncomfortable or um, maybe losing a, losing a relationship. I mean, things shift when you really live authentically. It will ripple out. It might even feel like there's a mass exodus, but what you will be left with is real. Like there is not like a piece of my life that is camouflaged anymore. I am lonely for sure but there's just no fraudulence, nothing. And I know what I'm doing. I love what I'm doing. I love God. I love channeling all these like divinely loving beings. And then I get to talk, like talking to you is like the highlight of my like month, you know? I mean, I we are here and we're available for help and, you know, like Rich and, and myself, 
I know our intentions align, especially with that, like just getting the word out there, letting people share their stories and knowing they are not weird. They're not alone. They're not broken. All right. Well, thank you again for sharing all that. That was very fascinating. It's probably something I'm going to have to go back and watch again three or four times, but yeah, no, I am going to go it. ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. You have a good day and I wish you the best. All right. Thanks, Rich. All right. Bye-bye.